So, you know, great thinkers throughout history have posed sort of deep existential uh, questions for mankind to ponder, and I'm going to pose one of those questions uh, to you today. What the hell is going on? <laughs> this region, this neighborhood, is being uh, buffeted. It's buffeted by, in the first instance, sort of twin typhoons of an America that appears in many eyes to be unpredictable, if not unreliable, and a China that is uh, much more muscular and uh, assertive and looks only to be getting uh, more so as it uh, goes ahead. You hear a lot of slogans about this. You hear they're almost magical incantations, rules-based order, win-win outcomes. But the fact of the matter is we're not seeing a lot of adherence to rules. We're not seeing a lot of order. And we're not seeing a lot of wins either. We're hearing about the free and open Indo-Pacific. We're hearing about the community of common destiny. But as I travel around the neighborhood in Asia Pacific, uh, it doesn't seem to me that either one of these constructs have a whole lot of credibility with uh, the countries in the region. And you hear about the China dream. You hear about America first. Well, think about it. Neither one of these are inclusive concepts. There's not a whole lot of room in the China dream if you're not Chinese. And the, there's not a whole lot of space in America first if you're not American. China dream kind of means you better sleep with one eye open. America first kind of means, well, I guess that makes you a second class citizen. And what's important is what I want, not what's good for us. So there's an underlying tension uh, that I see in the relationships uh, between the various countries in the neighborhood and the two major powers. And dramatically and unmistakably, there's an unprecedented and worrisome level of tension between the two major powers uh, themselves. And that relationship, the U.S.-China relationship, has devolved into a strategic rivalry, not just competition, and certainly not healthy competition, a strategic rivalry that is far more than a trade war and is clearly going to last a long time and is clearly damaging to global interests. The nearly universal view among governments and throughout businesses, particularly in this neighborhood, is that the U.S.-China rivalry isn't going to end well for anybody. The people that I talk to, the governments that I talk to, they want connectivity, not uh, decoupling. They don't want to have to choose in a straight binary way either between the U.S. and China or between economic interests or national security. So with all that as background, let's take a little uh, look around the, the neighborhood. So the longest lasting and really the most virulent threat that this region uh, continues to face is the threat posed by North Korea and North Korea's continued development of uh, nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction, and, and the means of delivery. Um, and, and the North Korea issue right now is in a bad and a dangerous place. Now, that may sound funny and not intuitive to you because, hey, isn't thing, aren't things relatively calm right now? It's not like 2017 with fire and fury and bloody nose and complete destruction. True. Uh, North Korea isn't conducting nuclear tests. North Korea isn't conducting uh, intercontinental uh, ballistic missile tests that directly threaten 
uh, the continental United States. But if you take even a half step back and look beneath the superficial layer of calm, uh, you see some very, very dangerous signs. As a starting point, let's remember, de-escalation is not denuclearization. The threat is there. And North Korean freezes have a nasty habit of thawing out. North Korea is building at a breakneck pace its arsenal of nuclear weapons and of ballistic, ballistic missiles uh, that can deliver them. And in the latest uh, missile tests has demonstrated a new function of maneuverability in the missiles and presumably the warheads uh, that make them even more dangerous. So the situation is not getting safer. North Korea's international isolation has ended. Kim Jong-un has been legitimized He's a great friend. Uh, he's a great guy. He cares about his people. He's a strong leader. And he's a peer to the President of the United States of America. That's not nothing. UN Security Council resolutions are no longer being enforced. Hey, this missile test may have violated the international law, but it didn't violate uh, Kim's promise to Donald Trump. So who cares? American deterrence, as a result, has taken a big hit uh, because if Japan and Korea are on their own when it comes to missiles that can hit them but not hit the United States, then what exactly is this nuclear umbrella of the United States? What exactly are the terms of the alliance with the U.S.? And the U.S. in the meantime has either halted or scaled back its joint annual defensive exercises with the Republic of Korea. This is training uh, to defend South Korea and defend uh, the U.S. and Japan in, in a crisis, not unimaginable. Guess who hasn't stopped doing their military exercises? North Korea. But what's uh, add also that instead of being able to present a united front among the five key neighboring countries, uh, Japan, South Korea, U.S., China, and Russia. Uh, North Korea has been successful in playing us one off against each other, uh, making for divisions, uh, and this gives this gives North Korea a lot of space to co-op to uh, exploit. Particularly since U.S.-China cooperation on North Korea has nearly come uh, to an end. But what's worse is that we have edged closer to a acceptance of North Korea's de facto nuclear weapons status. Maybe it's grudgingly, uh, maybe we don't say it out loud, but de facto, uh, North Korea, as it normalizes its engagement with the world, and as it gets us to focus not on ending the nuclear program, but on living with it, has created a successful model for nuclear proliferation. And that model is not going to sit on a shelf. That model is going to be emulated in the future uh, by others, and that's very dangerous. OK, moving right along. Then you've got the South China Sea. You've got the East China Sea, where China's strategy for pushing its claims isn't a legal one. It's not a diplomatic one. It's literally to push to bulldoze uh, coral reefs in the Spratleys and the Paracels and build up military outposts, uh, to deploy hundreds, not thousands, of fishing ships and paramilitary ships into the uh, exclusive economic zones of other countries, and, uh, right up to their uh, territorial waters, to uh, muscle into the resource-rich waters off their coasts, as uh, I'm sure we'll hear uh, in the case of Vietnam, to send wave after wave of aircraft and ships into the uh, areas that Japan administers uh, in the East China Sea. And speaking of Japan now, we are f looking at a real crisis in Japan-Korea relations, as uh, Philip mentioned, with two 
important economies, two democratic partners virtually at each other's throats at a time when we all need them to work together more than ever, uh, both in terms of security and economy. And I'll say because I and government was very involved working with our Japanese allies, working with uh, South Korean allies, uh, feel that uh, the U.S. has in the last two years neglected this problem. Not that it's our problem to solve, but we have an interest and a role in, in moderating uh, tensions, in discouraging uh, escalation. And I think we've waited until it's too late. And then uh, when the uh, U.S. government did try to uh, intervene, uh, handled it badly. You've got the demonstrations in Hong Kong, which uh, are important to understand. Frustration among the citizens of Hong Kong has boiled over. Uh, Hong Kong's promised autonomy has been uh, steadily uh, stripped away. And don't lose sight of this to mangle Bill Clinton's famous uh, campaign slogan. In Hong Kong, it's the autonomy, stupid. Uh, that autonomy, the ability of citizens to have a voice in their future and their affairs and to keep the institutions of the courts and uh, administration uh, healthy and clean and functional, uh, that is under attack. The one country, two systems construct has been sanded down, eroded, and now it's kind of a one country policy. The People's Republic of China doesn't really seem to be listening to the people. And the result is that the Legislative Council, uh, we Hong Kong chief exec executive have lost a lot of credibility with the public. And that heavy-handed police suppression has turned what started as peaceful demonstrations into a, a virtually a rebellion. It did not re restore order. Uh, and moreover, it's a kind of a rebellion with a lot of mainstream support. Uh, it's not just uh, fiery radicals and students. It's mom and pop shops. It's lawyers. It's civil servants. Uh, it's the full spectrum of, uh, of uh, the public in Hong Kong. Moreover, we better not forget that just five years ago, the umbrella uh, demonstrations and protests in Hong Kong were matched by the sunflower demonstrations in Taiwan. And Beijing's handling of the protests in Hong Kong have a profound impact on, uh, on Taiwan and the prospects uh, for Taiwan, especially for a younger generation there who aren't really driven by their grandparents' vision of a, of a unified China. And when they look at Hong Kong and they look uh, at the response by Beijing. They see uh, an example, a demonstration of what they can expect if Taiwan and the mainland were uh, unified. And this is coming with Taiwan presidential elections just five months away. And then lastly, I'd just draw your attention to that um, enigma wrapped in a mystery that is the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which Asia Society has uh, done a lot of work on. So is it a 21st century Silk Road that unites the entire neighborhood in a healthy network of, of trade and energy routes with benefits to everybody? Is it a heavy-handed neo-colonial strategic ploy for Chinese dominance, sort of recreating the old imperial model of uh, subservient vassal states? I describe it, Belt and Road, as a kind of uh, ink blot test, a Rorschach test, where different people look at the same thing and see something very, very different. And usually it tells you more about how they feel about China than it does about uh, what they're actually seeing. Uh, look, infrastructure in the developing world is desperately needed. You're not going to see a lot of people saying no to Chinese money. Okay. So 
It's filling a real gap. China has an excess of uh, capacity in steel and concrete, construction, wherewithal, and so on. China has a surplus of, uh, of capital, of uh, currency reserves, although it's shrinking a bit. China has very powerful uh, construction companies, uh, state-owned enterprises that are both very good at building and very fast, great engineering, um, but also have tremendous political juice uh, in, in China, and they need to move outside of China, which is already pretty well paved over. Um, and they are moving outside. Um, China, through Belt and Road, is creating uh, new markets and new ways to get its products to markets and new opportunities for uh, its advancing digital uh, companies like Huawei or um, Tencent. And let's remember that through that and through the digital Silk Road, uh, China is gaining access to what uh, many people call the new oil, big data. And it's bumping that big data uh, along its, uh, its digital Silk Road. So without a doubt, Belt and Road has uh, real and understandable benefits, and benefits uh, particularly to China, uh, benefits for developing countries, and potentially benefits for uh, countries like us, developed countries like uh, like Australia, Japan, the United States, Indonesia, Vietnam, and others, uh, if our companies are in fact uh, allowed to compete uh, for contracts, if they're allowed to invest in projects that are reasonably de-risked and, and, and credible. So, what's not to like? Why isn't everybody happy about BRI? Why is there this level of backlash against the projects and against the Chinese in many parts of the developing world? Why is there this level of uh, concern and anxiety about BRI in the, in the, in the West, sometimes bordering virtually on, on hysteria? Well, yeah, it's true. Sure, there are problems regarding the environmental impact. Sure, there are labor-related uh, uh, problems with BRI projects. Yes, there are endemic uh, corruption uh, issues. And yes, there is the matter of uh, sustainable finance and heavy, heavy debt burdens uh, from these projects. And um, yeah, there are adverse social impacts. But OK, these are discrete problems. These are real problems that can be dealt with, that should be dealt with. OK, that's not it. The underlying problem, the issue, is a lack of faith in China, a lack of trust in China's real intentions. And in many respects, it may be unjustified, but the reality is that our collective experience is what makes us doubt that growing Chinese influence will necessarily be benign will necessarily benefit the region, the neighborhood, uh, and the world. Well, that's a very quick and a wildly incomplete survey of, uh, of the neighborhood, uh, circa August 8th, 2019, minus all of the really profound uh, global challenges, ranging from uh, climate change to technology-driven uh, displacement and job loss and the social impact to rising populism and so on. But I'll just wind up quickly where I started, which is to say that strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China is bigger than trade. It makes the problems that the region already faces more difficult to, to deal with. And it's clearly doing long-lasting damage both to the two countries themselves and to the entire neighborhood. And it's not going to easily dissipate, even if there's a trade deal. Even if Barack Obama or Ronald Reagan get elected president in the 2020 elections, uh, it's not simply going to snap back to the Halkion days of old. So now is our chance to find out what our neighbors think uh, we ought to do about it. So I'll stop and move to the panel discussion. Thank you very much.